We have cracked maples. Cracked maples. Okay, thank you. Okay, so for recording purposes, I need to start. I said we are talking about the complications of breastfeeding in our postpartum period. We know that during pregnancy, estrogen and progesterone takes over. And at a point when pregnancy ends, we enter into our postpartum period. And with this, the um, prolactin also starts to act on the breast and that brings about breastfeeding. Now we want to talk about breastfeeding it's, and its complications. So now we all know that when, um, before breastfeeding starts, there is a making of the milk that creates tenderness in the connective tissue and then the fatty tissues causing the breast tissues to become enlarged, sometimes longer than normal, and then sometimes denser than its normal size and then the shape. So the um, production of the milk creating the denserness of the connective tissues and then the fatty tissues brings about the changes in the shape and then the size of the breast. Now, there are so many questions that are being asked that why is it that when a woman gives birth, the breast becomes bigger than the usual, the, the usual breast and then the shape also changes. So this is the reason why there is alternance in the shape and size of the breast. Now with this, we also have types of um, factors that affect breastfeeding. And then the first point to talk about is the maternal nutritional status. We all know that sometimes, especially with those who goes into the cesarean section, sometimes the pain and everything affects them from eating a good balanced meal. And then at a point you realize that um, being able to even breastfeed the baby becomes a problem. Not even the cesarean section woman alone. A normal woman who goes into labor. And we all know that biologically and psychologically, the, um, when the um, prolactin acts on the pituitary gland, it brings about um, in, um, involution of the uterus. So in this, when a mother tries to breastfeed a baby, the pain that comes or associated with it makes it difficult for a woman to put the baby to breast. So it can also bring about maternal um, nutritional status being affected. And then we also have partner support. At a point where a woman gives birth and then lacks support either from the partner or any family member. It can also affect the woman from breastfeeding the baby. And then we also have stress. If the woman is being stressed too hard on issues from the house, sometimes and there are many more. It can also affect um, breastfeeding. Then let's talk about the last point. That is the inability to latch the inability to latch the baby. I mean, the proper positioning of the baby during breastfeeding, it can also affect breastfeeding. Now, I believe we also know the stages of breastfeeding. That is the colostrum, the time that we, we, we express the colostrum for our baby, the transitional stage, and then the mature milk. These three, stages also comes in when we are breastfeeding the baby. I want us to go through this before we, we move to the normal topic of the baby. Mm -hmm. So with this um, colonial, that is Okay, so we have the colostrum. That is the first production of milk that is being produced and then given to a baby after birth. And then we also have the, transi the transitional stage, that is the milk which is being expressed few days 
after breastfeeding. And then we have our mature milk that normally starts two weeks after birth or two weeks during our postpartum life. So these are a few things I want us to talk about before we move to the normal topic for today. So I mentioned that today we'll be talking about some of the abnormalities. Sister Reta. Okay, let's continue. So, sister, um, yes, yes, please. Please, I didn't get um, the transitional. Can you come I'm, over it again? I'm saying that with the transitional, we have the cholesterol. That is the milk which is being expressed the first day of your postnatal life. The milk we give to our babies are called the cholesterol. And then we have the transitional um, stage. That is the milk which is being expressed few days after um, the production of the cholesterol. The breast milk we give to our baby few days after um, the production of cholesterol, that is the first day of breastfeeding, that is called the transitional. And then the last thing to talk about is the mature milk, which is being given two weeks afterwards during our postnatal life. That is where we express the mature milk. And with that, let's talk about the colors. The cholesterol stage, the color that is normally being expressed is the yellow color. It comes in the yellow color and then an orange color. That is the cholesterol. Then we have the transitional. That is also yellow color or sometimes white in color. Then the last point is the mature milk. That one, that starts two weeks after but that is the white color, sometimes the pink color, the clear, and then sometimes in the bluish color. That is called the mature milk. So talking about the complications of breastfeeding, we mentioned mastitis, we mentioned breast engorgement, we talked about um, breast abscess and then a whole lot. So let's start with our complication. But I want us to put this at the back of our mind before we even continue. Before breast abscess can set, can set in, I mean, during postnatal, the kind of complications that normally come, that comes before the breast abscess becomes the last thing to talk about, normally from the breast engorgement. Before a woman can end in breast abscess, it starts from breast engorgement, and then it also moved to um, breast engorgement, we move to mastitis, and then we can also talk about the crack nipple or the flat nipple. Then we can also talk about lactation failure, lactation failure. So those are the, the four things that comes in before breast Abscess becomes the last thing to talk about. So let's start from breast engorgement. Breast engorgement. I believe most of us are um, most of us are mature women. We've given birth at least once or twice or many. So we know what breast engorgement is. So let's share ideas before we add up to. Um, the, the breast engorgement. So let's share ideas. When we say breast engorgement, what comes into our mind? Let's talk about some of the causes. Let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms and then the treatment of breast engorgement. So let's share ideas. Or I should continue. Hello, Sister Justina. Anybody who wants to talk to um, me? Then. With the breast engorgement, there will be a little fever. Mm -hmm. The temperature of the woman will be high, and then mm -hmm. the breast will also be uh, um, warm to touch. And mm -hmm. sometimes there is a localized pain. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other points?
Sister Umi. Yes, Sister. Yes, Sister. Yes, the breast looks heavy too. Heavy. It looks yes. heavy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sister Rita. I was also going to say the heavy, but when baby is suckling, the mother feels pain. Feels pain, yes. Yes. Thank you. Any other points to add? Any other point to add? Okay. So you let's start talking about breast and culture. Someone is also saying breast also becomes tender to touch, yes. So let's start with breast engorgement. Breast engorgement is all about excessive production of milk into the um, milk ducts, causing the breast to become so much enlarged, so much enlarged. And some of the signs of signs and symptoms are the localized pain as our sister talked earlier on. And then we also have the heaviness and tenderness of the breast. In fact, there is this, there, there are signs of acute inflammation. And we know that the signs of acute inflammation is the pain, the swelling, the warmth, the redness, and everything. So when someone has breast engorgement, we experience or they experience signs and symptoms of acute inflammation. So due to the excessive production of milk, it becomes difficult for the mother to sometimes latch or position the baby for breastfeeding due to the pain. And sometimes the inability on the part of the mother to feed on demand. At least the mother has to breastfeed the baby like eight, eight to 12 hours in a day, eight to 12 times a day, sorry, eight to 12 times a day. But we will get mothers who are career women, they don't have time to breastfeed the baby. And sometimes even expressing the breast will become a problem for them. So in a situation like this, they leave the baby just like that. And at a point, they come reporting with breast engorgement. So when I say breast engorgement, we all know that it occurs due to the excessive production of breast milk. And then it's, it, um, another explanation is obstruction in the outflow of milk, obstruction in the outflow of milk due to the inability on the part of the mother to breastfeed. I am saying inability because they don't breastfeed the baby. Being it personal issues, psychological mm -hmm. issues, mental issues or anything, it affects the, the, the baby who is to be breastfed. So in a situation like this, there is also breast engorgement. Then another point is of milk by the baby. I am saying poor removal. Okay, let me cancel the word removal. Poor suckling on the part of the baby. And we know that there are so many factors that contribute to a baby not being able to breastfeed. And the first point is inability to, to latch. If we, we, we ignore the fact that we will sit in our comfort zones to breastfeed our baby, it ends up with the baby not being able to breastfeed. And then the, and then the not being able to position the baby well. Sometimes we leave them, we position them in our comfort zone. We forget the fact that the baby's buttocks is supposed to be in our palm, and then their abdomen touches that of us, and then the chin should be in alignment. And then we should alignment with the hip, but we neglect all those facts and then do our own thing. And then the baby ends up not being able to suckle well. So all these leads to breast engorgement. Then we, oh, the last point is it occurs in the mammary gland due to the expansion and then the pressure exerted by the synthesis and then the storage of the milk. If there is so much production of the milk into the milk ducts, and then there is 
inability of the baby to suckle, I mean, to ease or to create a space in the milk that to enhance accumulation of new breast milk. It also leads to breast engorgement. So all these can be um, an explanation to breast engorgement. Now let's talk about the causes of breast engorgement. The first point to talk about is make sure the baby, the first point to talk about is breastfeed, the inability to breastfeed the baby as soon as possible after delivery. Sometimes the pain, the trauma, and then the, the things that happens to the mother prevents the baby to put, the mother to put the baby to breast right after delivery. And this can be a cause of um, um, breast engorgement. So let's know that. Now, it is also a part of some mothers. It has become a part or also a part of some mothers to forget the fact that they need to breastfeed their babies at night. To breastfeed their babies at night. And then it is, it is accepted and it is assumed that when the mind is at, at rest, it enhances milk production into the milk duct. So at a point where a mother neglects breastfeeding the baby during the night or at night, it also, sorry, helps in the engorgement of the breast. And then the, another point to talk about is um, when expression of milk is being delayed, if you put the baby to suckle well, or you are, okay, let me make it a, as you are a career woman and then you are busy with work here and there, you cannot um, combine the fact that you breastfeed your baby with work. What you need to do is develop the habit of using the breast pump. You use the breast pump to ease yourself. I mean, you, you pump the breast into your breast, um, breast milk container, and then you ease or you create a space in the milk that you accumulate another um, breast milk. But if you ignore all these and then don't use the breast pump, the breast become engorged. There is so much pressure which is being exerted on, exerted on the breast milk that causing the breast engorgement. Now we should also develop a habit of avoiding a um, baby formula. Avoiding a baby formula. If you are someone who cannot stick to the exclusive breastfeeding, that you also always want to add formula to your baby. It even prevents you from, I mean, psyching yourself that you always need to breastfeed your baby like eight to 12 times a day because there is an availab availability of the formula. And this creates breast engorgement. So we need to stop the use of breast um, formula, the use of the formula feed, unless of course it is being prescribed to you to your baby. If not, let's stick to breastfeeding um, of our baby. And then we need to put it at the back of our mind that it is going to be done always eight to 12 times a day. Now, the, um, the last point I would want to add is it is not actually something that does happen, but let's also avoid the use of pacifiers while breastfeeding our baby, bottles or pacifiers. Sister Hannah. Sister Hannah. Okay, let's continue. So the use of pacifiers and everything, I mean, brings about the breast engorgement in the sense that the babies do not get the attention. You, the mother, like you, the mother wouldn't be able to even position your baby well to breastfeed. And the breast engorgement all boils down to the fact that we don't pay attention to how we position our baby when they are breastfeeding. So we need to look at that in order to prevent breast engorgement. Now, being done with the 
um, pauses, let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms that we see when um, there is breast engorgement. The first one to talk about is swollen breast. And that one, Sister Justina. Okay, someone is saying I'm not able to unmute myself. Okay. Okay, you you can send what you want to ask. Um, uh -huh. Hello. Sister, please, uh, uh, can you say breastfeeding a sick, a sick baby or a sick child? Being uh, a yes. Cause of it. Yes, can be a cause of the breast embolism. Because uh, the more the, the child is having an infection or any kind of illness, the child may have problems feeding, and this will enable or cause the, the milk to build up and lead to the breast engorgement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then the, we can also add what you mentioned earlier. If a baby is having the cleft lip or the cleft palate, it even prevents them from suckling. So we can add it to the fact that there is when there is infection in the child, it prevents them from suckling, causing the breast engorgement. Thank you very much. Let's talk about the signs and symptoms. As I said, the swollen breast due to increased milk production, due to increased milk production. Then there is also, um, there is also pain, pain, redness, the heat, the warmth, everything that I said, when we, we, we come to the breast engorgement, the signs and symptoms are the same signs and symptoms that occurs when there is an acute inflammation. So that boils down to the signs and symptoms of inflammation. Then another point is um, the nipple is also hard for the baby to grasp. The nipple becomes really hard for the baby to, to grasp. It is not... Um, soft like we used to when we touch them. So when there is breast engorgement, since there is an um since there is an uh, engorgement or accumulation of breast milk making the breast tender, it is it also gears to the nipple, making the nipple really hard for the baby to grasp. That also brings about the breast engorgement. Let's put it at the back of our mind that one of the benefits or let me say treatment, one of the treatment that we can talk about is when the baby um, is able to suckle. If there is breast engorgement and we, we position the baby well, the word is well, to suckle, breast engorgement may be eased. Let's put it at the back of our mind. Then we can also introduce gentle massages. Now we are talking about the treatment. How can we treat breast engorgement? When there is gentle massages on the breast, it can also ease with the um, breast milk production. Now we can also do the milk expression that I said earlier on. Let's say this. If there is a breast involvement, you can be at the world and someone will ask you, is it advisable to breastfeed when I'm experiencing breast involvement? Yes, breast involvement doesn't prohibit you from feeding your infant or your baby. You can have the breast involvement and still be breastfeeding. You can breastfeed your baby very well. And with that, the pressure on the uh, milk that can be eased can be or may be eased. So we need to do the um, proper positioning of our baby and then the gentle massages also aid in um, breast engorgement. Then we can also talk about, okay, yes, big nipple can also cause breast engorgement. It can cause breast engorgement in the sense where 
the nipple is quite bigger than the mouth of the baby. If not, it cannot cause breast engorgement. I have seen some before. I had a friend who had um, a big nipple and at a point the baby was not able to suckle after birth. So she was experiencing breast engorgement and then the introduction to the breast pump was done and then eventually the breast engorgement was eased and then she was good to go. So it may or may not cause breast engorgement. Now we can also introduce the breast support. Breast support. We can support the breast and then do a, um, a, a let me call it a warm compresses. If we support the breast very well, we can do the, I am not saying breast support in the sense where we put on brazier, yeah. but we can support the breast at a point where you feel you are not able to use the breast pump. Sometimes it becomes engorged like you cannot even hold it. So at that point, your partner or someone can hold it for you, for you to position uh, or attach the breast pump to the breast and then you um, withdraw the breast milk to ease you of the breast engorgement. <coughs> Sorry. Now, the last thing we will talk about is the milk suppressive drugs. The milk suppressive drugs. And one of the drugs, the drug is brococryptine. Okay, someone also said application of cold compresses. Yes, you are right. Application of cold compresses. We can also do that to ease the breast from um, pressure. So we can introduce the brococryptine. That is the 2.5 milligram daily for two to three days. We all know that whenever we are giving an intervention or treatment, the last thing we add to our treatment or introduction is drugs. So in this case, if you apply the gentle massages, the cold compresses or the warm compresses, the milk expression, the breast support and everything, but still we are experiencing the breast important. Yes, warm compresses, yes. If we do all these compresses or all these treatments and it fails, then that is a point where we add the milk suppressive drugs. That is the brococryptine, 2.5 milligrams daily for two to three days. No, we have cold and warm compresses. The two works, all the two works by easing the pressure on the breast. So it, it's not like we have the cold or no. We can do the we can do the cold compress and then the warm compress. They all ease the breast from depression. So these are a few treatments we can mention when we are talking about breast engorgement. Now I want us to, I mean, look at these differences. When we say we have, the, the, the breast is full. When we say the breast is full, yes, someone has sent the, the spelling of the book of prep time. Let's talk about um, um, what do you call it? The differences between a full breast and a gorge breast. We want to know the differences. Sometimes I may be experiencing breast engorgement and wouldn't know this is breast engorgement I'm experiencing, or this is full breast I'm experiencing. So let's look at some of the um, differences. Now let's talk about the full breast. Whenever there is full breast, there is hotness. So we no funi she she be bra, no funi e full like aye. When there is excessive milk production into the breast, there is hotness. Hotness. Now another point is it also become heavy. It also become heavy when there is fullness of breast. Then there is milk flowing. If the breast becomes full, you will see that it is not time for you to breastfeed your baby, but there will be a dripping of some of the breast milk from the nipple. That means you are having full breast, um, full breast milk. Then another point to talk about is there is no fever. When there is full breast, there is no fever. 
there is milk flowing, there is hotness and there is heaviness. That means that your breast is full. Now let's look at when there is breast engorgement. Now we know when there is full breast, these are the signs and symptoms that okay. Let's look at when there is breast engorgement. One, there is painfulness. There is painfulness. There is painfulness on touch. Meaning there is breast engorgement. And another point to talk about is edematous. 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 It becomes edematous. There is a difference between heaviness and edematous. When there is heaviness on touch, you feel like this thing is really heavy. But when it is edematous, when you hold it, it becomes too tender. Tender on touch. Now you trying. That means there is breast engorgement. Then another point is it becomes really hard, really, really hard, like a stone, meaning there is breast engorgement. Now, it's, the breast becomes also tight, especially the nipple. It becomes really tight. When you, you, you try to, I mean, use your index finger to press it up and down, you feel like there is tightness in the nipple, meaning there is breast engorgement. Then we can also talk about redness. It becomes shiny. Yes, thank you. It becomes really shiny, really shiny. You may see that this thing is shiny. It, it may look like you've applied oil on it, but no, it is due to breast engorgement. Then it may also look red in color. That means the signs and symptoms of activity inflammation would start to manifest. There may be redness. Then let's put it at the back of our mind is that our mind that, sorry, there wouldn't be any milk flow. When the breast is engorged, you wouldn't see the breast, breast milk flowing. Like I said, the full breast becomes, there is a, a dripping of breast milk from there. Um, when there is full breast milk. When there is an engorged breast, you wouldn't see any breast milk dripping from the nipple. Then the last thing we talk about is there is fever. There is fever. You may experience chills as I would do, as I would do. You may experience headache, something like that. That means that the breast is engorged. So these are the differences between a full breast milk, a full breast, and then, sorry, an engorged breast. So we are done with breast engorgement. Now let's talk about let's talk about um, cracked nipple, cracked nipple or a retracted nipple. When we say cracked nipple, it occurs when a baby is not attached to the breast wall. If the baby is not attached well to the breast or the nipple, you may see that there is a cracked nipple. Someone is asking about the differences again. I am saying that when there is a full breast, there is hotness of the breast. There is the heaviness of the breast. There may be milk flow or there will be a milk flow dripping from the nipple of the breast. Then there is no fever. In the case where there is full breast, there is no fever to the mother. Now let's come to breast engorgement. When there is a presence of breast engorgement, there is no milk flow dripping from the nipple. Two, there is fever or chills or pyresia or headache. These things occur when there is breast engorgement. Then the nipple also become tight, tight. Then the breast become edematous. The breast becomes painful on touch. The breast becomes shiny as well. And then it becomes hard. And then the, in the case of breast engorgement, the breast may look red, tender. All the signs and symptoms of acute inflammation falls out when we say breast engorgement. So these are the differences. And I am saying that we are talking about 
the crab nipple. And I said, crab nipple is where there is an inability or it occurs when a baby is not able to suckle well due to a poor attachment to the breast. I always tell people that from where we grew, we saw our mothers <laughs> after breastfeeding, uh, they hold or they just, they just put the baby right away from the breast. But when you learn, you get the, the knowledge that you need to insert your little finger into the mouth of the baby. And then you gently pull out your nipple from the mouth of the baby. If you do not do that or you do not practice that, you always force your baby to, I mean, remove the nipple from the mat. That brings about the cracked nipple. You may have a, a baby who may press the gum firm on the nipple. So with you, you forcing to remove it, it brings about the cracked nipple. Apalane can the gum be okay, ka gum, okay, ka nipple. So it brings about the cracks or the breakage on the nipple of the mother, causing the crack nipple. So with this, what are some of the um, causes of crack nipple? The first thing to talk about is on the part of mothers who use the breast pump, they, they, if they do not use a size which fits their breast, if the breast pump has a smaller flange, it puts um, it puts much pressure on the um, on the breast pump, uh, the, the the breast nipple, causing the nipple to be cracked. If they don't use the breast flange, which is or which fits their size, it brings about the cracked nipple. So that is the first cause of cracked nipple. Then the next is not positioning the baby well to breastfeed. Not positioning the baby well to breastfeed. Poor positioning of the baby. Sometimes the baby, the head will be on the um, breast or <laughs> it will be attached to the breast to circle and then the body will be somewhere. In this case, they, they will even keep on, I mean, dragging the nipple towards them to, to make them comfortable to circle well. And with this, it can bring the crack nipple. Then not finding the ideal way to breastfeed. It, it all boils down to not positioning the baby well, not finding the ideal way. You, you may teach a client to, I mean, do a correct positioning of their baby, but at a point you will see them indulging in a different style of positioning, which also, I mean, help the nipple to be cracked. We don't, they, 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 they don't, I mean, sometimes you tell them and they are like, oh, yeah, mommy, move free. Emma, move free. Yes, they, they even think that we don't know. But if we all, I mean, do it or we take the fact that we need to do the ideal positioning of, their, uh, of breastfeeding, it may prevent these issues altogether. So these are the three causes we can talk about when we talk about cracked nipple. Now let's look at how we are going to treat our clients when they come with cracked nipple. The first thing we need to tell them, we can ask them, auntie, so how do you breastfeed your baby? Now you are back complaining with um, complaining that you are having a cracked nipple. Can you demonstrate to me how you breastfeed your baby? And you may see the difference. And you may even know that this is the cause of, these are the cause of um, the cracked nipple. So sometimes we, we, we have to, someone is asking of the first point. I am saying that we should find that we should allow them to, I mean, do a return demonstration. Sister, can you go over the process? Okay, I'll go over. I'm saying that some of the causes of crack nipple is not finding the ideal way to breastfeed. 
not finding the ideal way to breastfeed our babies, and then not positioning our baby well. And I'm saying that you can link the not finding the ideal way to breastfeed the baby to not positioning the baby well. And then the last point is using a breast pump which has a, a smaller flange, a smaller flange, or not using your size. You put a breast pump here, a switch and what, and I switch and what. You beat me a day and cracked nipple. Abba. So the, the treatment of cracked nipple, I am saying that we have to find improved ways to latch a baby, improved ways. And I'm saying that how are we going to find the improved ways of latching our baby? We can ask them to demonstrate to us how they breastfeed their baby. And that will give us a clue on how to teach them to improve their ways of latching. Then we can, the next point is we can avoid using harsh soaps, harsh soaps, deodorants, anything that is harsh. We know that the nipple is being, um, has small holes or small pores in it. That, I mean, helps the baby to breastfeed. And no, no, we consume draining through to the baby. So if we, we ignore the fact that we need to, um, stop using these harsh things, the deodorant, the soaps and everything. It enters through the small holes. It enters through that hole and then it can even cause infection to us. That means there may be a presence of, a presence of breast abscess or mastitis. So we need to stop using harsh soaps, deodorant, powders and et cetera. Now, we, the third point, we should also avoid wearing tight braces. From where we come from, we heard our grandmothers teaching our mothers, I mean, put on a tight braces so that our breast will be in the age of age. They have, oh yes, you can use the molent creams. Yes, I would mention it. That is my last point, but thank you for bringing it up. We, where we come from, our grandmothers were teaching our mothers, put on a tight visor so that when you, you stop breastfeeding, you will still have your breast being in shape. That was the mentality they were giving our mothers. But it was, uh, it, we, we, we saw the changes when we became midwives. And now, even when we try to teach them, they are like, oh, bad, a very simple. They don't accept the fact that we've learned that the tightness of the brazier doesn't give the shape or the size of the breast. So we should also teach our clients to avoid wearing tight braces, which may increase friction on the nipple. The tight braces brings about the friction of the nipple, causing cracked nipple. So we should also um, teach them. Then, the last but one point is we should apply, you can apply breast milk on the cracked nipple. If there is a cracked nipple, you can apply a breast milk. After breastfeeding, you fetch some of the breast milk and then you apply it on the nipple. And this will also help um, easing the pain and then it will aid in healing. You apply it on it and then you leave it to dry the crack nipple will resolve by itself. Then the last point I want to mention is the application of the emollient cream, the emollient cream or coconut oil. Emollient cream or coconut oil. You can also apply that to ease the tenderness of the breast and then during the tenderness of the breast, you can apply oil to ease it. And then to the nipple too, you can apply to ease the pain on the cracked nipple. So now we've talked about breast engorgement. We've talked about cracked nipple. Now let's talk about lactation failure. When I'm done with the lactation failure, then we will come to the mastitis and then the um, 
says that the bra can decrease the size of the breast in the into holes with big breasts. Those with big breasts. Really? Ah, well. <laughs> okay. Thank you for sharing. So let's talk about um, lactation failure. Lactation failure. And this lactation failure occurs when there is insufficient milk or there is no milk production to um, enhance the baby to suckle. That is the lactation failure. Lactation failure. If there is no milk production or insufficient milk production, it brings about the inability of the baby to suckle or to suckle or ride, but wouldn't get enough breast milk. So this also is a complication of breastfeeding in our postnatal or our postpartum period. So in this case, I mentioned it when I started talking about this complication. When we are um, pregnant, we know that two hormones shard the estrogen and then the progesterone. So in a case where um, the estrogen and progesterone takes over and you give birth, now we know that there is an action of another woman that is the prolactin. When the estrogen and progesterone is pro producing it like excess, really excess, it counters the prolactin. And we know that the prolactin brings about the breast milk production and then the ejection into the nipple to the baby. So if there is um, the estrogen and progesterone takes over or overrides the prolactin, that brings about the lactation failure. So you can put the baby to breast, but the baby would not get enough breast milk to breastfeed. Or there may be no production of breast milk. So with this, meaning you have to, I mean, introduce supplementary feeds to your baby. You give them a formula to replace what the baby is lacking. So the lactation failure have given the definition. So with this, there is the need to start top feeds for the baby within three months of delivery due to inadequate breast milk supply to the baby. Now, the causes was what I mentioned, the insufficient milk production, the um, insufficient milk production leads to lactation fever, and then no milk production also leads to lactation fever. Somebody is ask, asking of the definition. I am saying that the lactation failure is where there is no milk production or there is inadequate production of milk to breastfeed the baby due to the action of progesterone and then estrogen, overriding prolactin after birth. So talking about the definition and then the causes, what can be some of the treatments we can use? The first treatment to use is frequent feeding. Frequent feeding. Now, if there is inadequate or no milk production to the baby, the baby is also supposed to get the, 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 the um, qualities that we get from breastfeeding or breast milk. And if in this case, the baby is not able to get them, now we, meaning we need to introduce the formula and then the feed for the baby to be able to get the strength, the vitamins and everything that he or she needs to build up. So in this case, we need to do frequent feeding just as we do when we are breastfeeding them. And it is also, there is also another perception that even if you are not able to breastfeed the baby well, or uh, there is not enough breast milk for the baby to suckle, if you put the baby to bre breast regularly, it can help in resolving the inadequate breast milk supply to the baby. So we can do that. If we continue to put them on um, breast milk, it will help in resolving the issue of lactation failure. Then adequate rest. If the mothers are also able to rest enough, enough, 
if they are able to rest enough. And then if a mother gives birth and assuming the mother is um, having days, baby blues and everything, <coughs> sorry, it prevents the mother from even putting the baby to rest. Sometimes they will do, but if the mind is somewhere, how can there be a production of prolactin? so that there would be ejection of breast milk into the nipple for the baby to suckle. So all these things help in bringing the lactation, uh, lactation failure, sorry. So in this case, we can also enhance adequate rest. We can teach the mother on how to take enough rest to prevent lactation failure. Now we can also teach them on having good nutrition, good nutrition. They can eat well. From where we are coming from, <laughs> when we were young, you hear your grandma telling your mother, oh, eat um, mashed kinky, you get enough breast milk. Eat granite, you get enough breast milk. Those things, we had no explanation to that. We asked them and they wouldn't get a better explanation for you. But in this case, if you are able to teach them to take their fruits, the protein and everything, everything coming together, it will help the mother in, I mean, being able to produce the milk for the baby to suckle. And then the last point or the last treatment I can talk about is enough fluids, enough fluid. They can take enough water, they can take fluids, liberal fluids that will help in, I mean, giving, getting the strength to, and produce the breast milk for their babies. So this is all about the lactational failure or the lactation failure. Now, I said it when I started the class that having breast engorgement, having cracked nipple, having um, lactational failure, having um, retracted or flat nipple or inverted nipple, all these things comes together. If they are not treated well, brings about mastitis or breast abscess because mastitis is infection. The breast abscess also is infection. So if we leave all these things untreated, it brings about the mastitis or breast abscess. So now let's talk about mastitis. And I said that mastitis is an infection. So the definition of mastitis is an inflammation of the breast, an inflammation of the breast. So let's talk about some of the causes. We have some of the causes to um, mastitis is we have infective mastitis. Let's talk about the types first. We have um, clinical. We have clinical, we have subclinical, and then we have um, chronic mastitis. Clinical, subclinical, and then chronic mastitis. When we talk about clinical mastitis, it is an inflammation in response to infection causing visible abnormal milk. Inflammation in response to infection. It is an inflammation in response to infection. We learned in our pathology class that, is it pathology? Yes, pathology. That when there is an inflammation, it is as a response of infection. So infection by an inflammation ever. So in this case, clinical mastitis means um, inflammation in response to an infection, causing visible abnormal milk, visible abnormal milk. In a case like this, if you want to see that this mastitis, this type of mastitis is clinical, you can, I mean, educate your, uh, your client to use the breast pump to fetch some of the breast milk, put it, put it there for like, and hours, then you will see that it has formed this bumpy thing, meaning there is a presence of clinical 
mastitis. If you want to note the differences between these mastitis, these are some of the things you can use to detect, oh, this is clinical mastitis, this is subclinical, this is chronic. So in a case where there is clinical mastitis, there is a formation of this ball, bumpy things in the breast milk when it is being fed and put at a place for a um, number of hours. This will tell you that this is a clinical mastitis. Now let's talk about the some of let's talk about this subclinical mastitis. This subclinical mastitis is detection by physical examination. Detection. You can see that this is a subclinical um, mastitis when you do physical examination. And this you can help the woman sit down and then you make some touches on the breast. You are touching for the tenderness, the firmness the, the um, redness, the hotness of the breast, this will tell you that this is subclinical mastitis. Then the last mastitis we can talk about is chronic, chronic mastitis. And this chronic mastitis is lasting breast pain with no evidence of acute inflammation, with no evidence of acute inflammation. There is a lasting pain. No phone be ya wya sa wu baby ya ya uni free ba. And this there is a stabbing pain in the deep tissues of the breast. Stabbing pain. No say as ya di baby e wo unu funim. Meaning there is a chronic mastitis. Although you are breastfeed, you are in your postpartum period, but you are experiencing this. So in this case, you ask yourself, what is happening to my breast? When there is a stabbing pain in the deep tissues of the breast, it means there is a chronic mastitis. Now, let's talk about the causes. I am saying that the causes, it is grouped into two. We have infective mastitis and then non-infective mastitis. The infective mastitis is caused by bacteria. It's caused by a bacteria. So you can link the infective mastitis to the clinical mastitis. It is almost the same. Because when there is a clinical mastitis, that is an inflammation in response to infection, meaning the bacteria, that is the infective mastitis, caused the inflammation. That is the clinical mastitis. Then the non-infective means it is not as a result of inf infection, but you are experiencing the acute inflammation. That is the, um, the chronic and then the subclinical. You are experiencing, when you, you do physical examination, you can see that this place is hot. There is a kind of lump here. The breast is tender, kind of red. These things, you can link the subclinical and then the chronic to the non-infective. It is not as a result of a bacteria, but still the person is having the mastitis. Those are the differences between the mastitis, when we say mastitis. Now let's talk about how we are going to be able to treat mastitis. Now, the first treatment, if somebody is saying come again. <laughs> Okay, I am saying that there are three types of mastitis. We have the clinical mastitis, subclinical mastitis, and then the chronic mastitis. And I'm saying that the clinical mastitis occurs, it is an inflammation that occurs as a response of infection, an infection, or as a, um, it occurs due to the presence of an infection. Then the subclinical mastitis, you, you can or you may be able to confirm that this is a clinical, a subclinical mastitis during your physical examination on the breast. During your physical examination of the breast. Then the last point is the chronic. And I'm saying that the chronic, the um, explanation is a lasting, a lasting breastfeeding 
due to this is a lasting breastfeeding with no evidence of acute inflammation. A lasting breastfeeding due to um, due to no evidence of inflammation. And I'm saying that with the chronic, what you can be able to use to determine that this is a chronic mastitis is that the mother will always complain of a stabbing pain. And the pain, it is not localized. I mean, she's complaining that deep, deep inside the breast, that is the deep connective tissues and the deep fatty tissues, she's complaining that there is pain. There is pain in the breast. This is the chronic mastitis, the chronic mastitis. So these are the types of mastitis. And I'm saying that there are two causes of mastitis. Somebody is asking that does mastitis increase one risk of breast cancer? It may. I, I cannot say that it can increase, but it may increase the risk of breast cancer. It may. I am not saying it can, no, it may. So noting the types of mastitis, I am saying that there are also two causes. When somebody asks you about causes of mastitis, the first one that needs to come into your mind is the infective mastitis. And I'm saying that the infective mastitis is when there is a bacterial infection in the breast, a bacterial infection in the breast. And we have the non-infective mastitis. That one, it, that the mastitis do not occur due to a bacteria, no. But the mother will be complaining of the tenderness, the, each, uh, the cracked nipple, the tenderness, the redness and everything. And I'm saying that for it to make, for, for the process to be easier to you, link the types to the process. I mentioned earlier on that we have clinical mastitis. That is an inflammation with response to infection. So the one with response to infection, you can link the infective mastitis to it. When there is infective mastitis, there is a clinical mastitis. When there is a, a non-infective mastitis, there is a subclinical mastitis and a chronic mastitis. That's all. Don't complicate yourself. So, talking about the treatment of mastitis. Yes, in this case, in sub -mastitis, sub clinical mastitis and chronic mastitis, there is no sign of inflammation. There is no infection. Let's talk about the treatment. We can try different position in breastfeeding our babies. Different position in breastfeeding our babies. If you are always used to doing the either the cradle method of breastfeeding your baby, you can try the, um, the cross cradle and there are different types of breastfeeding. You can do that. You can do the, the lying down, you can lie at one side of your bed and then you give the breast to your baby to breastfeed. All those can help you ease either the pain or anything that is causing your mastitis. And I'm saying that you can, the next point to use or the next treatment is you can use cabbage, cabbage leaves, cabbage leaves. And this cabbage leaves, when being put in the water, you move it and then you cover it on your breast. I have tried as much as I can to know the pathophysiology, how the leaves are able to relieve you of your pain. But so if any of you know the, the, the pathophysiology of how the cabbage leaves when you can get up. But all I know is when being placed on the breast, it helps to ease the pressure on the milk ducts. 
the alveoli and everything is being eased. The isthmus or the bas basket cells is being eased from the milk production, causing the uh, breast to be relieved of its pain and then the tenderness. That is what I know. So if any of us know the pathophysiology, I don't know how it, it, it does work, but all I know is it eases the S9 cells and everything from the um, milk production. So if you know it, you can bring it up so that we can all learn. Then the last but one point is hot compresses or cold compresses. They all relieve us of the pain and everything when we are um, having mastitis. Then the last point is the breast massage. <coughs> Sorry, the breast massage. You can also massage the breast to ease us of the, um, the, the tenderness, the pain and everything. But in the case where a woman is having the clinical type of mastitis, that an infection, meaning the woman has to take a drug. The woman has to take antibiotics to prevent her from um, this mastitis, not prevention, to ease her of the signs and symptoms of mastitis so that the mother can continue with breastfeeding. If the mastitis happens to one breast, meaning the mother can use the other breast to breastfeed the baby. But in a case where she's having these two breasts, being um, having the clinical mastitis, meaning the woman has to stop breastfeeding and then feed the baby with a formula. Then afterwards, she can continue breastfeeding her baby with the breast. So this is the um, treatment we can use whenever we are having mastitis. So now the last thing to talk about is breast engorgement. Breast engorgement. Hey, sorry, breast abscess. Breast abscess. So breast abscess um, occurs, like I said, when there is cracked nipple, there is mastitis that is blocked that block that if the that's in the breast is being blocked by stasis of breast milk or something it causes the mastitis so when there is cracked nipple there is mastitis or blocked that there is breast engorgement and they are not treated that leads to the breast abscess the signs and symptoms of breast abscess is there is tenderness of the breast of the breast. There also be lumps in the breast. Lumps, which is not malignant, but benign. When I, I say benign lump, it means it is not cancerous, but the lumps form due to breast abscess. So with this treatment can result in the breast. And then there can also be a general feeling of unwellness. You cannot typically say that I am having headache, I am having, having this, but you are generally not unwell. That's the result of breast abscess. And there can also be high fever. High fever. The mother will be running temperature here, it rises, it comes down, it rises, it comes down, it rises, it comes down. The redness, the hotness, these are the signs and symptoms of breast abscess. Now, the treatment of breast abscess is this may be incised and drained. Abscess may be incised and drained. When we say abscess, meaning infected, there is an infection. So in this case, there will be lump. And the lump is arised by the action of, um, what do you call it? That is in the, in the brain. So we can, when there is a hardness or the lump on the breast, we add or we can incise into the abscess and then we drain the fluid from it and then the mother is okay. 
Now, the mother can also continue breastfeeding. If it's a happy to one breast, you can use the other breast to breastfeed the baby. The fact that the abscess happens to one breast doesn't mean that it is being affected by the other. There can be an abscess in one breast and then you can use the other breast to breastfeed baby. Then there can also be an introduction of analgesics. The analgesics, analgesics aid in easing the matter of the pain, the headache, and everything. Then the last is the production of antibiotics. You can also give antibiotics to resolve the infection in the breast. So this is breast access. Now the last thing is whenever a mother or when we have clients coming to us with breast engorgement, mastitis, cracked nipple, breast abscess, lack they can this can give a mother a sign of puerperal pyresia. Puerperal pyresia. She is always complaining of headache, pyresia. Bright temperature, and everything. If a man has all this, I'm not saying one mom experience all these things, no, but if any of these are not being treated, the mother can run into peril pyresia. That is another topic we will talk about in our next meetings. So we are done for today. I'm open for questions. Hello, sister. Yes, please. Um, the signs and symptoms. Uh, uh, there was a client that came to the facility and she was having this um pass draining from the mm -hmm. breast. So my place is a, a, a cheap zone. So I reported and then we sent her to the hospital. So when they went, they told her to go and do um, a, a, an FBC mm -hmm. for good match. Uh, so to know the type of the causative organism, I wasn't on that. I didn't yes. know the reason. For, uh -huh. So I wanted to find out. Okay, thank you. The kind of um, causative organ for this is the staphylococcus. So they want to find out the causative organism so that they will link it to the type of antibiotic to be used to treat the pest. That is why they did the aha, open and cross-cutting and then the positive reason. Thank you. We all know sir. that when the infection and you treat it, if, the, if it is streptococcus and you use staphylococcus drug to treat streptococcus, then the infection may test. Do that and that if streptococcus they give drugs with regards to the streptococcus to treat it. So that is reason. Someone is also asking about the treatment of um, breast abscess. I am saying that we can use analgesics to treat breast abscess, meaning we use the pain, the headache, everything. Then we can also use antibiotics. And that is to treat the breast Then there can be a pass formation in the breast. Then the last is um, we also can do breastfeed. It's a happy, it happens to breast. We can use the other breast to breastfeed the baby. Okay. Sister Rebecca. Okay, sister. Yes. Mine my, my is about the breasts. She okay. said that if it is benign, but before you'll be able to even do the insulin and drainage, you need to do biopsy. Yeah. But that will be possible before we do the the go in. Yes. Because, because my father is issue. 
And mm -hmm. we went with the first biopsy. And they mm -hmm. say it's a forest axe. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, we did, uh, did another one today, the same again, another biopsy. So, mm -hmm. um, chronic breast abscess. And you see that the lamb is getting bigger, reddened. Mm -hmm. So the doctor wanted to confirm the second biopsy. That's why he asked us to do the second one. So by Tuesday, he's going in. So it, could it be possible that the, that whole uh, lamp, that hard thing inside could be taken away? Because when we asked the doctor, he said if he take away, because it was big, he, he will end up by taking the whole breast away. Yes. So he's only going to incise and drain that thing. And doing the drainage, couldn't it be possible that it can come again? It, okay, so that's the question, right? Yes, please. Okay, thank you for the question. Can anyone on the floor help us? She's asking us, there is um, breast abscess, and this is characterized by a huge lump in the breast. And then she wants to find out that the doctor is suggesting that there should be an incision to drain the past formation in it. So can it be that after the, the drain yep. the path, can there be another formation? Okay, Sister Kristen, Kristen Love. Yes, yeah, Sister, please, when they say they do the incision, they must take a sample from the breast to do bio, uh, histopathology for the, the uh, the abscess uh, breast tissue to do histopathology to rule out what is the really cause of that. If they don't do histopathology to rule it out, it will happen again. Thank you very much. Sister Fosti. Sister, please, my one is a question. Okay. Sister, please, my question is about the clinical mastitis. If mm -hmm. the mother continues to breastfeed the baby with that breast, won't the baby be infected since it is caused by a, a bacteria? Thank you for the question. I'll come back to your question, okay? But let's finish with our sister's school. She asked the question and someone answered that there should be a histo, that we should take it to histopathology for another test. We can, she, what she said is really true. We can do an incision in the breast and then we drain the pus. But we will take a breast tissue and then we send it to find out if it is cancerous, if, if it is a presence or a malignant tumor, meaning it is recurrent, a best But if it is um, benign, if it is benign, the chances of it being recurrent is low. It's low. So let's put that at the back of our mind. Anything malignant, if you remove it, it will come back. And that can be cured by using the chemotherapy and everything. But in a case where it is benign, it, the chances of it being recurrent is low. So that is my little idea about it. The most important thing is finding out if it is malignant or benign, and then afterwards, we take it from there. Now, someone also asked the question that if someone is having the clinical mastitis, can, can the mother breastfeed? I said that if it occurs to the two breasts, the mother cannot breastfeed. But if there is a chance where it happens to only one breast, the mother can feed the baby with the other breast. And that is okay. If one breast is affected, you can position the baby to breast and breastfeed the baby with the other breast. Since we all have the knowledge that Okay, and I, if since we all have the idea that when someone is having the 
um, when someone is having mastitis, or when someone is um, having mastitis, it doesn't mean that. Okay. okay, sorry, pardon me for that. So in this case, we need to find out and then we know at a point where we believed that the breast, one is water, one is food. We were, we were being misled. But now we know that regardless, the two breasts contains the same nutrients that we give to our babies. So in a situation where one is not well, one is affected that we cannot breastfeed our baby with, the other one is there that we can use. And that doesn't mean that the baby will be affected. So let's put that at the back of our mind. Thank you very much. Sister Astana, your hand is up. Hello, madam. Yes, please. Please, uh, uh, I have a client who complained of her uh, after breastfeeding. She actually went to the child. And after that, that, that ends it. She, she, her breast milk never stopped flowing. So, and then, I, didn't, uh, I didn't hear your question. Well, you are saying that you I had a uh -huh. I had a client who came in reporting that uh, she breastfed the baby and then win the baby. Uh -huh. For about two years, she win the baby. And after mm -hmm. that, uh, she, her breast milk never stopped flowing. Mm -hmm. After winning, like she still have breast milk discharging for okay. about a year after winning. So uh -huh. I've been asking this question to know because uh, she went through so many tests, uh, tests, and then they say it seems not to have any problem. But we all know how delicate uh, breast is. Sometimes mm -hmm. uh, little. This thing that you do, the person may end up having problem that you least expected. That's why I'm asking. Because uh, like she's still flowing, she's still lactating. She has breast milk in her breast. Then meaning the prolactin hasn't stopped producing, right? That's what I think. But yes, because we all know that the uh, prolactin, I mean, acts on the pituitary gland so that there may that there is a milk production. This is actually my first time hearing it. Can somebody help us? Sister Fuseini. Sister, my question is that. Uh, hey, hold on. <laughs> no, no, no. Hold on. Hold on with your question, please. I want I'm, to... I'm going to this next question. Okay, 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 okay. Uh -huh. My point is that if they have, has their husband been suckling the breast? <laughs> maybe if <laughs> maybe if if she has win the baby and the husband is always suckling the breast, definitely mm -hmm. the breast milk will not stop. <laughs> and you know that's where we <laughs> ladies we like the enjoyment, the excitement. So the <laughs> breast milk. Will not stop. So. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> Can somebody help us again? <laughs> sister Rebecca. <laughs> Hello, sister. Yes, please. As, what Asana is saying is very true. It, it happens to me. Mm -hmm. And when and when I went to the doctor, the gynecologist, mm -hmm. he told me, uh, someone told me the chance of me, uh, if the breast milk is in, still inside the chance of me getting pregnant will be very difficult. And when I went to the gynecologist, he also said some, something like that, that the chance will be, is not high, but the chance of me getting pregnant will be very difficult. So my, that's my first one. So he has to put me on uh, bromocryptin, yeah, bromo 2.5. So I took it and the breast milk stopped. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, please, so you, I got pregnant to my second. The bromocryptin. So yes, you was for three days. For three days, yeah, two to three days. It has to stop. So currently, but it's two and a half. I still have breast milk still in my breast. 
even the breasts are big. It's very small, small. So very what Asana is saying is very true. So she has to go and see the gynecologist for oh, okay. that thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for answering our question for us. With your experience. Sister Fosti. Yeah, sister. Yes, please. Sister, please, my problem is, you know, when uh, one breast is infected and you are breastfeeding the baby with the other one, you know, the breast, the more you are breastfeeding, then the other one too is uh, filling up. Mm -hmm. So now that our client is having a, a clinical mastitis uh, of one breast, and then the one breast is healthy and she is breastfeeding the baby with the other one. When she is breastfeeding, won't the other one be aggravated? Yes, yes, it will. It will. Can somebody help us? Um, I've seen. Okay, this is Rebecca. Yes. So since it's uh, uh, the cause, the response of infection, she she needs to be expressing it out. Yes. Because the mother is breastfeeding this one, the mother where the breast milk is coming. So the, she has to try. Sometimes it's painful, but she has to try and then squeeze it and throw it away. So the, if you feed, the more the time you feed, the more the time expressing expressing it and then be throwing it away. Thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing it up. Now let's uh, let me add it, this: if you are experiencing the clinical mastitis, and then there is an infection. Infection is characterized by the acute inflammation signs and symptoms. In this case, there is redness, pain, everything. So it makes breast expression difficult. So in this sense, we can use the manual type of expression without using the breast pump. Because we all know that if we are going to use the breast pump, we need to, I mean, adjust the, the flange of the breast pump to arrest and aggravate the pain. So in this case, type of massaging, the type of massaging the breast can help us. Using the massaging method is a form of doing the manual expression of which we will talk about in our next two meetings. We'll be talking about manual type of expressing breast milk. So in this case, we have to use a spoon. You get a spoon, you wash it, you get a cup, you wash it, make it clean. If you are going to use it to feed your baby. But in the case of clinical mastitis, we cannot be feeding the baby with that breast milk. But that doesn't mean that you should put it in a filthy container or something. But for you to even be, be satisfied that this breast milk is infected, you can fetch it into a clean bowl, you leave it for some time, for hours, and you realize that it will try to make folds, forming bumpy things, ball-like things, meaning that it is infected, that breast milk is infected. So we can use the manual method of expression to express that milk and throw it away. We don't have to give it to the baby to introduce that infection into the baby. So thank you very much for answering the question for me. Any other question? Hello, sister. This suggestion, yes, please. We know that uh, normal breast milk, when you put it down, whether if it's not even infected, the normal breast milk that has a, like clean breast milk for the baby, when you put it down for a while, like more than eight hours, it will start uh -huh, spoiling. So I don't know how long this one has to be. Because uh, I, I used to uh, breastfeed, I, I used to express breast milk for my kid when I was schooling. So mm -hmm. when, when it's there for more than eight hours, you come and it's falling to form those bombs you are talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, there wouldn't be any color change though. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I want to know how long this particular one has to stay before you can tell me it has uh, that infected breast milk. Okay, when there is an infected breast milk, if you fetch the breast milk and you put it at a place for two, at least two hours upwards, two hours upwards, you will see that it has started for the, for, um, forming that bumpy things inside. 
A normal breast milk takes more than takes eight or hours or more to get spoiled. But when this um, breast milk is infected, it if it starts from an R, you may see that it has started forming the bumpy thing inside. So if you see that thing, you see that, okay, this breast milk is a clinical, um, this breast milk is coming out from a clinical mastitis um, postpartum woman. So in this case, you don't have to wait for the eight hours. First hour to two hours, we will start four minutes for you to see. So thank you for alerting me. Any question, addition, subtraction, you can bring it up. Is there any question, any addition, any subtraction? Anything you want a clarification, you can bring it. Are we okay? Okay, start Rebecca. Yeah, so mine is not a question. I think it's add up with the breast engorgement, how to position the baby. You mm -hmm. said um if you want to release the breast from the baby's mouth, you put your hand in the baby's mouth and then try to release it. But sometimes if we allow the baby to get satisfied, they remove it themselves. To get satisfied, him or her will release the breast by Herself without you pulling because if he's not yet satisfied, you are trying to remove it. Yes, meaning they will stop and the breast will come out. Okay. The breast will come out from their mouth. Then we're removing it, trying to remove it, then we will be struggling with them. So if they are only satisfied, then there's no problem for them to stop and then it will come out from their mouth. Thank you very much. Thank Someone you. is asking the number of hours a normal breast milk, take, breast milk takes to get spilled. It takes eight hours. After eight hours, it is spoiled. Without, if you, if you, that doesn't mean that it is in the fridge. If you express the breast milk and leave it somewhere here in a normal temperature, under a normal temperature, it takes eight hours to get spoiled. But if not in the fridge, if you put it in the fridge, it takes more than the eight hours to get spelled. So let's put that at the back of our mind. You are welcome, dear. Sis, please, can we have the recording? Oh, yes, you can have it. It is being recorded. So uh, Mr. Isi will share it to your various platforms. So thank you very much. I believe the class went well. Oh, how was the class? It was fine. Wonderful. We were going so fast. Thank you, sister. We were going so fast. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going fast. <laughs> I'm sorry. We will share the the recording. Okay. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your time spent on me for even having the listening ears. God bless you so much. God bless thank you. Thank you, sister. Okay. We really appreciate your, your, oh. your lectures. Thank you. So God willing, next week, same time, we will continue. Have a wonderful